It is the 31st century. Earth is in the midst of a dire resource shortage due to the introduction of a drug known as fluoraldichthoral phosphate. Boom, got one. Better known by the layman's term, anti-age. This new drug was designed to greatly extend the lifespan of the average human being. However, this also had the side effect of increasing the population by exponential rates as less people were dying of old age, and babies were being born into a world rife with increasingly overcrowded conditions and scarce resources. A stopgap measure was introduced to alleviate the overpopulation problem with the construction of orbital stations known as satellite holding bays. But these stations become filled with people quickly, and living conditions degenerate just as fast. In 3046, the Oxalex Corporation have perfected the Artificial Atmospheric Simulation Procedure, which makes the establishment of colonies on Mars a real possibility. As well, the resources on Mars could finally be exploited to alleviate the troubles of Earth and humanity. But of course, the human population continued to grow larger, and their industries required ever yet more resources to be fed. So, it was not long before Mars would eventually reach the point of resource starvation as Earth had. Colonization efforts on Venus and the other planets in the Sol system would eventually take up the resource burden for Mars, but eventually these planets too became devoid of resources. It became clear that Earth had to expand outside of their home system to survive. While the exact details in history are unknown, the Earth Empire had managed to successfully create their first warp hole to the nearby system of Alpha Centauri in 4175, thus opening up a new age of exploitation and colonization to the ever-demanding needs of Earth. Soon after, warp holes would be created to other systems, such as Draco, Diomedes, and of course, Galanir. But while the Earth Empire had solved its resource crisis for the foreseeable future, all was not well among the colonial populations. Discontent from colonists from every system outside Sol began protesting the brutal working conditions and harsh treatment by the Empire and its colonial navy. Any time a protest or revolt began formulating, the Imperial military would typically crack down hard. As discontent and rebellion grew, the Empire continued to tighten its stranglehold on the colonies. It was a matter of survival after all. Earth and the Empire needed the resources of its worlds to maintain itself and its populace. If Earth's colonies refused to work on their behalf, then the Empire's survival and power would be jeopardized and condemned to a slow death. It did not occur to the Tsar, the ruling leader of the Earth Empire, to lift their draconian means of control over their wayward sons and daughters or maybe even allow them a larger portion of the spoils of their work, instead of having Earth take everything for itself. No. Earth needed, nay, deserved those resources as they were the birthplace of humanity. The accounts of how the first colony war and how the League of Free Worlds started are mixed, but the first stirrings of rebellion began with the formation of the League in 4275, followed by open fighting between the two powers in 4299. What ignited the war and the formation of the League are two events the first uprisings in the Alpha Centauri system, and the destruction of a colonized planet by the colonial navy due to its citizenry protesting the Empire's grip. While it is uncertain which event came first, in all probability, the most likely scenario would be the devastation of the colonial world. From this point, the first colony war can be divided into four phases. The early phase, the middle phase, the late phase, and the final phase. It must be pointed out that the first war was not one long continuous high-stakes struggle, as there were several gaps between each phase in the war where conflict was presumably minimal. The early phase is counted as the span of time between 4299 to 4317, where the inexperienced warriors of the League found themselves either losing ground to the Earth Empire or forced into bloody stalemates. The only saving grace for the League during this time being the incompetence of the Colonial Navy's service people, and possibly due to the need for the Empire to stretch itself thin to maintain its holdings. The middle phase was between 4352 to 4397, where the League struck back in a series of offensives that won them an uncounted number of colonial planets from the Empire. But this upturn of fortune for the League of Free Worlds would not last during the late phase, between 4490 to 4525, with the Empire's colonial navy striking fiercely against the League fleets. Only the threat of mutual economic collapse for both factions did this phase in the war come to an end. The most important phase of the war, however, would be the final phase between 4593 to 4620, which saw the emergence of a mysterious figure known as the Father to the leadership of the League of Free Worlds. Many agree that it was through the Father that the League was finally able to achieve victory in the end. 
By this late stage in the war, the might and skill of the colonial navy was formidable, and the League was forced to using guerrilla warfare tactics to harass Imperial operations across the known worlds. The League would continue to use these tactics well up into the turning point of the First Colony War, the Battle of Benet. The detailed accounts of the battle have been mixed, but it is known that the Tsar sent an overwhelming colonial navy task force to Galanayr that was almost guaranteed to have the power to crush this upstart League once and for all. But the League of Free Worlds rallied and refused to allow the dream of freedom from tyranny to die. Over the skies of Benet, the League tore the colonial navy into pieces, forcing them to retreat from the system. The League of Free Worlds had accomplished the seemingly impossible, in one climactic battle, they stood against the full might of the Tsar and the Earth Empire and triumphed. Benet had become a symbol of the strength of the League's cause. Also, with the severe mauling of the Empire's navy, the League had bought themselves time to build their forces to fully secure their freedom from Imperial aggression. As it turned out, this was a prudent course of action. Perhaps unwilling to live with the shame of being turned back, the Colonial Navy invaded Galanire yet again. But this time, the League of Free Worlds was more than ready and even with the majority of the pilots and service people being inexperienced in combat, they turned back the Empire's lackeys in much the same way they did at Benet. If he had not before, then the Tsar now knew the strength and conviction of the League. But under no circumstances would Earth ever give up on trying to crush these rebels. No one understood this more than the Father. There was only one way to truly safeguard their futures. Rally the fleet, go to Seoul, and bring down the Earth Empire's tyranny once and for all. The Father knew that any attack on Seoul would be a foolhardy attempt unless the League could take the Draco system first. Draco was important to the Colonial Navy as its massive industrial base and research facilities made it the center for the manufacturing of weapons and military spacecraft. Simply put, in terms of the Empire's military, all roads went through Draco. If the League could take the system, or at least heavily cripple its facilities, the Colonial Navy in turn would be severely weakened enough to make a League invasion of Seoul a tangible reality, which was exactly what the Father did. League forces spread out through the systems attacking supply depots, mining stations, fuel convoys, manufacturing centers, and in one spectacular case, using a captured Navy cruiser to infiltrate the funeral convoy of a high-ranking officer so that the League could access the Silicon data banks in his skull to get at the intelligence within. The League clearly relished their new role as the aggressors, and found success in many of the battles its pilots found themselves in. It was not long before the Earth Empire's presence was nothing more than a footnote in a history book of the future. At last, the preparations for the warp hole jump into Seoul were complete. The spirited pilots and service crew of the League bravely charged forth into Earth's space, fully intent to put the final chapter in a centuries-long era of oppression and greed. But right from the beginning, the League faced stiff resistance. For you see, in every system that the League had fought in to date was on behalf of oppressed peoples yearning to throw off the chains of the Earth Empire. But now, they were invading the homes of a people that would fight tooth and nail to drive them out. The same spirit of passion that drove the League to victory at Galanire in the past found itself instilled in the hearts of the people of Earth and Seoul. The League would find victory in certain engagements, such as raids on supply depots or the destruction of countless installations. But the Earth Empire fought with such aggression and zeal that the League constantly found themselves barely holding on to its tenuous position in the system. The losses to League war materiel and manpower were both staggering and completely unsustainable for very long. It is unknown how long the League of Free Worlds held on in Seoul, but at some point League Command came to one inescapable conclusion. They could not throw away the lives of those who served in a bloody meat grinder when victory seemed almost impossible. Instead, a contingency plan was called into action. This last-ditch effort to win the war involved the withdrawal of all League forces from Seoul, followed by the destruction of the system's only warp hole, effectively trapping the Earth Empire within its home system. As Earth needed the supplies from its extrasolar colonies to sustain itself, this would guarantee that the peoples of Seoul would die a slow, lingering death. The League withdrew and sealed the warp hole. While the reports coming out of Earth were few and far between, it seemed that the entire Seoul system was already in the grip of a civil war to fight over what little was remaining. Some within the League argued that this was a cruel and inhumane punishment brought down on the peoples of the Empire, but others argued it was no more than they deserved, for the brutal and oppressive treatment the colonies had to suffer under for centuries. But still, for all intents and purposes, the Empire was no more. 
or more accurately, it was no longer a factor in the galactic landscape outside of the soul system. From this point forward, under the guiding hand of the League of Free Worlds, the colonies would enter a new era of peace and freedom. Little did anyone know that back on Earth, the seeds of vengeance had already been planted.